talking about the new normal and the impact of COVID-19 on the drinks industry. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Drinks, in, the drinks Association and the Embrace Difference Council acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, the purpose of the Embrace Difference Council is to establish the drinks industry as a destination of choice by facilitating awareness, challenging perceptions and building practices that attract and develop and retain diverse industry talent. Now, this doesn't happen by itself, and there are many people in the industry who put a lot of work into the council, and this is done through three platforms. First off, the Create Difference platform, which is about focusing on gender equality. The See Difference platform, which is about supporting members to improve organisational diversity um, and leverage difference, helping to develop inclusive leaders. Now, the Embrace Difference Council is always on the lookout for new members. So if you're interested in finding out more, please reach out to your head of HR, um, the company board member for the Drinks Association or the Drinks Association directly. So we still have a few attendees logging in. Um, so we'll start the webinar in, in a minute's time. Um, for those of you just joining, welcome. Um, now, I'm sure we're all used to attending events online like this by now. And actually, being virtual does come with a few benefits. One of which is we can hold this during work hours um, because I know a lot of us have commitments before and after work, so that's one bonus. Um, and whilst we would have held these events in person in each state, a virtual event like this does mean that we can include all of the states regardless of the COVID-19 restrictions. And not just attendees, our speakers today are from SA, Victoria and New South Wales, New South Wales meaning we get an even greater variety of perspectives, which is a great opportunity for me to introduce them to, uh, to our speakers today. First of all, I would like to introduce today's facilitator, Sally Byrne, who is the general manager of coffee at Coca-Cola Amatol. Thinking outside of the box has been key to Sally's success at Coca-Cola Amatol and throughout her impressive career. Joining CCA in 2014 as head of marketing for the Australian Beer Company, she is now the general manager for Coca-Cola Amatol's coffee business. And with two decades of experience in marketing, innovation, project management, consumer insights and sales, working in CCA, Campari and Diageo in several senior roles, it suffice to say we are in very experienced hands for today's event. Welcome, Sally, and looking forward to the session this afternoon. Now for our panellists, um, with our first one being Sarah Parks, Director of Independence On-Premise and Field for Treasury Wine Estates. Sarah joined the Drinks Association Board in 2018 with 20 years experience in the drinks industry, both in the alcohol and non-alcohol beverage sectors. Um, Sarah's worked in senior roles at Diageo and Guinness, as well as working at PepsiCo, giving her valuable FMCG experience before heading back into the liquor industry, joining Treasury Wine Estates in 2017. So welcome, Sarah. Next, we have um, Louise Cooper, Legal Affairs and Risk Management for Cooper's Brewery. Um, Louise Cooper joined the brewery in March 2019, having previously worked as a lawyer for over seven years. She is the third member of the sixth generation to take up a full-time role at the brewery. And Louise was on the Cooper's COVID-19 response team, which led the company through changes in work practices while aiming to maintain business continuity. So really looking forward to hearing more about that later on. And the third panelist today is Eric Thompson, Global Marketing Director for Pernod Ricard Winemakers. Wine Originally from Toronto, Canada Eric, um, Canada, Eric has over 18 years experience in the drinks industry, leading sales and marketing teams. Working at Brown Foreman and Diageo before joining Pernod Ricard nine years ago, Eric has worked not only in Canada, but also the US and now Australia. And with a young family of his own, two gorgeous girls, Eric is a very keen advocate of flexible working practices whilst maintaining a strong core vision for his team. So welcome to all of our panelists. It's fantastic to have such a breadth of experience here today. Now, there will be a Q&A section of the event, so if you have any burning questions to ask the panel, please use the Q&A function in um, Zoom to submit. Um, and for those that miss anything, a recorded version of this webinar will be available. So hopefully we've got everybody logged in, and I'll hand over to Sally to kick it off. Fabulous. Thank you, Emma, and a very big warm welcome to all 270 of you who have registered today. Um, initially, I was quite surprised that so many people had signed up because there's no doubt there's no shortage of information feeds on COVID-19. So it got me thinking why I was surprised. But the obvious reasons are everyone joining today has been radically impacted by COVID. 
everyone here has a unique and ongoing personal and or work situation that hinges on COVID. And I think everyone on this call has been totally over it at one point or another, and they just want to move on. But very few of us on this call knows about our sector peers, which is a more pleasant term than competitors, and how they've been impacted. The pitfalls, the upsides, and how they are planning their organisations in the future. So it makes sense for this to be one of the main drivers behind why you are joining in today over the many other forums discussing COVID. And this is the beauty of the Drinks Association and the collegiate nature of our sector. We are very fortunate to have an industry association that coordinates this, as well as an industry that is collectively supportive of it. And lucky for us, we have three of our industry's finest as our panellists providing their insights today. So let's get them in the hot seat. We'll start with a relatively easy and broad one for all of you. And I'll start with you, Eric. And the question is, overall, do you think COVID has negatively, positively or neutrally impacted your company culture and why? Off to you, Eric. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I think, you know, with any challenge comes opportunity. And I think for us, we, we believe that there will be long term positive outcomes for, for us from a cultural perspective. I, I, you know, there's no doubt that things have been incredibly challenging over the last uh, few months, but we've seen some uh, massive uh, swings in our company's ability to be agile in multiple ways. I think from a flexible working perspective, I don't think we, we knew what we didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know around how flexible we could be from a working perspective. And we've seen that happen across all functions of our business um, for, from people working from home to the ability for our, our business to adapt from an operational perspective and, and you know, keep, keep wine moving out the door. Um, and that's been a big win. I think, you know, we've also got to know our, our colleagues a lot better. I think it, uh, it wasn't very often, or we never really had the chance in the past to see people's partners or kids or roommates. Uh, and over the, you know, the course of the last few months working from home, you know, I've had my kids join me on, on calls, um, you know, different people have their dogs and, and cats and, and whatnot joining them in various parts of the day. And I think that there's a, a different type of connection now that we as an organization have because of, you know, things like that. You have, I think everyone's level of empathy goes up once you, you understand people's, you know, ecosystem uh, a, a little better. And I think, you know, lastly, from a business perspective, um, you know, again, going back to that idea of agility, we've been able to adapt uh, and unite around a common goal of coming through COVID in a really strong way. And I think from a cultural perspective, you know, th those wins of coming through, you know, relatively successfully are going to uh, bode well for the future culture here at Bruno. Fantastic. Thanks, Eric. How about um, you, Sarah, given that you've um, been in lockdown for over 100 days um, in Victoria, what about your company culture? Um, well, yeah, well, it's certainly been a roller coaster because obviously we've got our head office in Melbourne, a big supply team in South Australia, and then our national team as well. So, um, you know, it really has been um, a roller coaster, I think it is the word to describe. I, I would say our culture has definitely came together quickly at the start and there was a real positive impact. Um, we also had quite a unique situation where we changed CEOs kind of in the midst of it with Tim Ford coming on on the 1st of July. And he really used both that appointment and that time to reset some of our people priorities. And I think that was really well received. So, you know, that made me think around how do you also recalibrate and use a crisis like this without a change in leadership to really reset what's important as well. Um, we also used, um, we had an opportunity to do a global study and just checked in with the team more than we have done in the past. So I think that increased level of communication was well, well received. And, and we heard from the team that they felt like collaboration and a well being um, and working together or that kind of can do attitude was um, better than it was pre COVID. So, yes, yeah, certainly some positives that have come out of it from a team culture. Um, no doubt for our head office team here in Melbourne, you know, the last 100 day plus, we've had to lean on that culture really hard because for individuals, 
Um, there's been some really challenging moments and it's hard to divorce the company culture to personal circumstance, I think. Um, I'm glad we're doing this today and not a week ago because we really were um, hanging on, I think, by the, um, by the skin of our teeth. So, you know, it's been great to have some news, um, you know, today on premises starting to open. And, um, you know, we're just talking about that before there's still a road, a road out as people look to retrain, you know, get staff, get product back um, and, and ready to trade. But, um, you know, we're, we're up for the challenge down here in Vic, but, um, yeah, it's been, um, we're, we're very glad that we've, um, that we're coming out the other side. Nice. Yeah. So are we, we all are. <laughs> um, and what about, what about you, Louise, over in SA? Uh, yeah, thanks. We've, we've been really lucky in SA, but we do um, have a team in Melbourne that we've all felt very sorry for. Um, I think in terms of culture and the impacts, I think at the moment there's positive and negative impacts, but I hope that overall it will be a positive um, impact. Of course, the negatives are, you know, the team in Melbourne has been completely isolated and it's been incredibly tough on them as those of you in Melbourne would know. Um, from a positive perspective, I think there's a tremendous amount um, of empathy and compassion and goodwill floating around the business. We've been incredibly lucky that we haven't had to make any um, cuts um, employment wise. And I think um, a lot of people's uh, friends and colleagues, uh, friends and ex-colleagues in other organisations have, um, you know, seen the impact of job cutting, um, which has obviously a huge impact on company culture. So um, uh, to give a bit of insight, we've got a, a HR platform um, that we use, which is an ongoing pulse check of sentiment amongst employees. Um, and when we ask the over, overall feeling that most um, people were feeling during uh, the height of COVID was a sense of gratefulness, uh, which I think is a really positive sign for culture. Um, but the number one request was to bring back Friday night drinks. So I think there's a bit of a mix there. Mm. Thanks, Louise. And I might um, stick with you on this one, given the, the makeup of your organisation and, and that shift, that radical shift of working from home. And most of us, um, certainly in head offices, in functional roles like finance, IT, have had to pick up their desk and move it home. I think she's frozen, Louise. If you just want to. Oh, okay. I was checking. I wasn't. I was checking. I wasn't frozen. But um, yes, I think um, it, it, talking about working flexibly. I mean, uh, yes, it's been a um, a uh, it's been an adaption for us, seeing as though really we didn't have much of a working flexibly policy beforehand. So the IT team and the um, oh and s team really had to quickly mobilise to get everyone working from home in a matter of days. Um, but I think probably the biggest impacts have been on production and sales. Uh, production, uh, we've, we, uh, within a, a day, almost less than a day, we'd separated all the different teams so that there was no crossover between teams so that um, if uh, there was any, con you know, um, any sickness, amongst staff, even if it wasn't COVID, but just a cold and we needed them, we were able to take out a whole team and keep running production. So that was a really big um, move for us to do. And everyone was amazingly um, helpful in getting that um, sorted quickly. Uh, that involved getting temporary lunch rooms, bringing in, you know, uh, caravans and um, things like that for uh, people, well, huts for people to have their, so to separate all the break facilities. Um, I think for sales, that would have been a really big mm -hmm. adaption as well, because um, so a lot of people say they become sales reps because obviously they love the human contact and they get to be on the road out of the office environment on a day-to-day -day basis um, and they've had to completely change their way of working so that they're working from home and calling customers instead of actually going and visiting them so um, I know that for that team that was a big adaption as well. Yeah, we've got an interesting story in Victoria. We had a new Victorian um, state sales manager who started, I think, um, first week of June and he's yet to meet his team. So um, lucky he's within the business. So he's got some relationships to, to draw on. But it certainly 
has been um, uh, yeah, a, a challenging time for field sales. I think there's some, um, when I was reflecting on this question, there are some elements that we will keep post COVID once we can, everyone is back on the road. And an example of that is our national sales briefing. So previous that was done in state, delivered face-to-face -face by each of the state teams and actually having the opportunity to um, do that virtually and hear from our marketing directors or hear from our brand leads who really are the subject matter expert um, on some of the activity. We had some really great feedback from the field team that, you know, they certainly want to come together. Uh, as you said, Louise, they thrive on that kind of face-to-face -face, um, contact, but actually hearing a message consistently from senior leaders in the business is something that we are going to continue um, continue to um, keep as a ways ways of working going forward. So, it, it, um, it's interesting actually that you say that because it's actually been very similar for us. We we started out during the beginning of pandemic of having a we decided that as a leadership team that we wanted to keep people up to date as you know as much as possible. And we 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 kicked off for the first time ever having like a weekly business update from our our CEO and. It, you know, at the beginning, it was very much focused on you know, COVID and, you know, the changes in which, you know, we were going through organizationally, you know, uh, having to adapt to that. But what we found really quickly was that the level of engagement of those weekly sessions was greater than any sort of updates we'd ever had in the past. So it's actually something that we've decided to, as we've transitioned into actually just talking about the future business um, and the day to day, it's something that we've actually kept in place. It'll be a little less frequent, probably bi-weekly now, and there'll be, you know, guest speakers, whatnot. But we found that that virtual engagement and those like more frequent touch points is being really impactful uh, from an engagement point of view. Okay, team, I'm back. So you obviously found out I had technical issues. I don't think I realised it for quite some time. Um, I think we were on the same question. Do you want to give me a nod? Yeah. Yes, we were. Okay. But speaking of engagement um, and the typical tools that I think a lot of us have adopted during this virtual time around, you know, online trivia quizzes and Zoom drinks, I'm getting the sense that it might some fatigue might be setting in. Um, and we certainly talked about this. So Sarah, have you noticed that? And have you seen you guys sort of changing or wanting to tr try things differently? Yeah, look, I think everyone started off with a flurry of Zoom drinks and, and you know, it's very personal, right? For me personally, you know, I got the, to the end of the day or end of the week and kind of didn't really care if I saw another computer screen again and, and you know, trying to manage it with two primary school children at home you know, I felt like I just needed to take that collective breath at the end of the day, whereas I know other people really um, wanted and needed that, con that, that connection that was outside of a work meeting. So it was always trying to, you know, have a range of activities that suited um, a number of people. What we did, which was I thought was a great initiative, is when we went into lockdown two, um, we set up a lockdown festival team and they looked at things outside of just virtual drinks. And, and, you know, I have to say, we all can't wait to get in the pub again very soon and have, a, have team drinks. But, you know, that they, they brought um, to the broader team things like, um, you know, um, exercise sessions, you know, find a hobby and an opportunity to build a new skill. Um, I think we've had more connection with our winemakers in the last six months than we've had certainly three years I've been here. So that's been fantastic to tap into that. And actually that the only other, um, um, you know, interesting share here is that we've been able to leverage some of our sponsorships and talk to whether it's the AFL, um, you know, some of the AFL teams prior to grand final or coming into spring racing, some of our connections there. And, and, and one thing slightly off topic, I was just so pleased to see on our AFL, AFL panel that we had um, last week, a uh, selection of male and female players. And I just think how far we've come, you know, having a daughter, the fact that in 10, 20 years time, that will be the norm, um, you know, uh, you know that, that that's very new for us here to, to, um, to talk to both the male and female um, players of the sponsorships that we leverage. So, yeah, look, I think we're all over everything virtually, but we needed to do it. It was a great chance for everyone to kind of come together um, and, um, you know, I, I think there's some stuff that we will take in um, to, to the future going forward. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. Let's um, change tack for a second here around um, brand and personal brand and, and usual styles that might have worked, but now that we're operating differently. So, Louise, I'm interested to hear from you how you've noticed individuals um, potentially change their personal brand or continue it on, given that the ways of working have changed so much. Yeah, it's a, a good question. I personally think the people that have stood out are those that um, make the ability to change and um, work flexibly, not just, you know, work from home, but work flexibly in every sense of that word, um, part of their core brand and promote that um, internally and externally. I know certainly when we're recruiting people, um, I, we didn't think about it that much before but now the ability to adapt and I mean I think the word's being overused but pivot uh, I think um, the ability to be able to do those things while um, maintaining business continuity um, and uh, you know the goal and ultimate vision for the company is an incredibly powerful skill so people that have really um uh, brought that into um, their personal brand and what they offer the company. I think they've stood out and I think um, those are the ones that have been um, really successful during this time. Sarah, any observations from you? Yeah, I think it's really leveled the playing field um, in some regards because we really are coming together to discuss and share business um, content. And I think there's, we all know there's some people who are great at that, you know, 10 minute networking in the kitchen or the ability to connect and build a network at, um, at drinks and, and actually everyone being in the same situation without all of that discretionary effort, um, I, I feel like it's really leveled the playing field. And, and, you know, to Louise's point, the people that have really risen to the top are ones that have gone out of their way to collaborate and, um, you know, a real team player willing to, to go extra effort to help others. Like, I think we've just seen some great characteristics come out from individuals that maybe in a normal working environment, um, we wouldn't have seen. Agree. Um, so Eric, over to you around, um, you know, you've got a role that, that relies and um, inspires a fair bit of innovation. Um, and I think we can all agree we've seen a stack of innovation happening um, in many different ways since COVID. I'm interested to hear the long-term effects of, of that thinking and do you think we can keep up the speed and pace at which we've been doing it of late? Uh, I hope so. I think there's probably, you know, obviously there has been a, there was an acceleration as consumer habits changed pretty quickly. So I think for most of our businesses, you know, we had to change you know, how we activated our brands. So there was a ton of innovation around the, the shift to, to the digital space. You know, live events obviously got diminished pretty quickly. And those starting to slowly come back, but I think we've seen uh, a paradigm shift there. And I think we're going to have to continue to innovate how we bring all of our brands to life uh in a in different and interesting ways you know probably um much more you know uh, virtually than we than we have in the past i think from a product uh perspective yeah i think consumer habits uh, there's no doubt they're going to be impacted long term i think you know the at-home occasion uh, has definitely accelerated and i think um you know those types of consumer habits shifting are going to probably force us um as you know uh as as producers uh, and you know brand brand experience providers to have to adapt and change uh, pretty pretty quickly and continue uh, along you know, at least for the foreseeable future for sure. But our expectation is that yeah, uh, innovation in all aspects of our business is something we're going to have to keep our foot on the gas for for sure. Great. And, and while I've got you, um, you know, I know you're in a role and most people on this call to a certain extent are in roles that have required a fair bit of travel um, to do their work. It's certainly a symptom of the drinks industry and that's all come to a grinding halt. Um, you know, what have you noticed and what do you think will change for you personally going forward with this change? Um, I, you know, personally, I, 
I, I love the opportunity to have dinner with my kids most nights and uh, read them bedtime stories. It's, it's rare that, uh, you know, I would go a week without missing a few of those evenings. And I think I'm, I'm really loving that opportunity. You know, that being said, I, I do think that there's a role in our industry around bringing people face to face. And I think it's really hard to replace both uh, internally and then customer facing the ability to actually, you know, meet people face to face. So I think, do, do I ever think that we'll go back to the level of travel that we had in the past? Probably not. I think we've all realized that we can work really effectively, um, you know, in, in formats like this. How, uh, however, I, I do see that there will be a shift back uh, to, you know, both in to both meet internal customers as well as, you know, meeting, you know, consumers and customers um, externally over the course of the next few months as kind of restrictions uh, ease in both, you know, here and then, you know, probably New Zealand as well. And um, Sarah, what about you? I think I've seen you more in an airport um, in the last five years than I've seen you anywhere else. So how are you yeah. feeling about it? That's where you meet most of your contacts. Uh, so last year, I was looking at the stats. So in 2019, I did 58 flights, um, all domestically, or, yeah, mainly domestically. And my last time on a plane was on the 10th of March, flying to Perth, um, just as it was all breaking. So yeah, it's been a significant shift. Um, totally agree with Eric that I think that, you know, being home every night um, with the kids has certainly um, been a unique and fantastic experience. Um, however, I, I do think it will, there'll be some things that will change and some things that will, that, that will need to come back, right, but particularly in our industry. I think we've all, because we've all been on the same um, page, we've been able to lean on relationships that we've built over time. So I think, um, you know, gone are the days where we will fly, I think for one hour customer meeting, right? Which kind of seems quite ridiculous when you even um, consider it now. But, you know, I do think we are in an industry where we want to connect, engage and build relationships. And I think that will continue to be important. I think, um, you know, I, I've seen a really great um, you know, conversation around, you know, task-based activity can be done anywhere, but it's that kind of training engagement relationship that does require some face-to-face. -face. So how do you, um, you know, be quite deliberate around when you travel and, and, and when you go to the office, right, and when you work from home? And I think it really is about the, the task that you're performing. Uh, the only other thing that, I've, that I have realised recently with such a gap in travel is I have missed the, um, the time out that travel does provide, um, you know, two young kids, um, busy role, you know, it is the one time when no one, um, you know, I wasn't that, you know, when they started to bring Wi-Fi back onto the plane, that was kind of, you know, when they started to introduce that was a bit of a double-edged, um, you know, situation, because I do think it was the time where you weren't in meetings and you weren't on phone calls and it actually gave you some really good thinking time and some good catch up time. And I've really realized that that's something I've missed recently because it, it just feels without that face-to-face -face contact, you're in meetings all day. And then, you know, you, you finish your last meeting and you're straight and, you know, cooking dinner and there's not really a transition. So just having that time out and, and having a bit of time to, 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 to reflect and to plan is something that I'm looking forward to um, when travel resumes. Yeah, I think um, you have a lot of people who agree with you on that last point, particularly. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Now I just need to, uh, we've got a couple of questions coming through on the chat and um, keep it coming because we will move to those questions shortly. I'll just cover off one or two more now. Um, Louise, just from a Cooper's perspective um, and having to start to be quite quickly a more flexible work environment, um, and knowing that your organisation, family business might have had some traditional um, policies entrenched. Has anything changed in the short term? And are you going to keep any of that going forward now in terms of that working flexibly, family support, etc.? Yeah, definitely. We didn't, um, beyond sort of the um, legal requirements of working flexibly, we didn't really have much of a um, uh, an additional policy, um, whereas now we do. Um, I think, uh, as Sarah said, I think it's about finding the balance um, because we're an organisation which is small and um, there's not 
there's not big teams where you've got multiple accountants that could do the same thing or um, you know you can't easily sort of take over so the teams are quite small it's really important for us to have really good connections not only within the team but also um, across teams um, and I think the thing we found when we saw everybody well a lot of the workforce other than production working from home is that you do um, in a way it's very hard to maintain those um, cross connections between teams um, intra-team they become very very strong because um, a lot of the team, our teams were talking every day, whereas normally they might not even talk to each other every day, even if they were at work. Um, more of the problem is that, you know, you might end up with, and potentially, not that we saw it because it was not for a very long period, but you might have more of a divide between, you know, sales and the finance team, for example, because at the moment we've got the benefit being a small company. Um, you walk into the kitchen and you see someone from a different team there. And it's almost that um, those incidental interactions. And also you've got a lot of that incidental creativity that happens where um, teams um, cooperate with each other just because they know from observation and those interactions what the other team is working on. So we don't want to lose any aspects of our culture or the um, incidental creativity but we do at the same time I think most of the managers here have recognised that people can be at times more productive from home than they are in the office because you don't have the constant interruptions and even just taking out the travel time to and from work um, is a huge benefit. Um, so yeah I think the focus just getting the balance right moving forward will be our key focus um, whether we do more you know whether we've certainly put in a working flexible policy for, um, now and I think we'll see how that goes and take it from there. I mean there's the first question in the chat actually is around that connectedness to states um, and the interstate piece so we'll, we might explore that a little bit further in a sec. Um, but before we go over to the Q&A, I just uh, wanted to ask around um, what I think everyone is always on everyone's minds is around the mental health factor um, and what organisations are doing to support that. Um, and, you know, I, I, Sarah, I kind of throw this one to you because it's so pointy um, and so so needed out of Melbourne. So, so what has Treasury been doing in that side of things? Yeah, we've done a lot in this space. Um, you know, we've all, we have raised it on the agenda pre-COVID, right? And obviously it's accelerated um, over the last um, six to eight months. But, you know, we, we've had a number of workshops, which I'm sure many businesses have done around resilience, um, around mental health. But one of the recent changes um, that we've just rolled out, which um, has been fantastic, I believe, is we've actually changed our sick leave policy to, to wellness leave. Um, and really made it clear that that is available to everyone for their mental and physical um, uh, health. So really um, um, role modelled that this is, you know, not just for visible illness, but for when people need a break and when people need um, support that, that, that we are um, acknowledging it. So I think we've really um, raised the conversation around uh, mental wellness. Um, we've had senior leaders share their experiences, which has remo um, removed some of the stigma as well. And, um, you know, we, 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 we check in more regularly than we have before, there's no doubt. And, and I think it's, um, um, it's really credibly embedded uh, and still way to go, of course, but I, I really think we've, we've done a great job in this space. Fabulous. All right. Now I'm going to go to one of the questions in the chat and I might bounce back and forth, but I think it's a really great one um, around recruitment. Um, so the question is, how have your companies approached recruitment during the last six to eight months? And has this opened up new opportunities in how you attract talent? So has anyone got an immediate thought in that arena? I mean, we, we've certainly, we've brought people on that haven't met the teams yet. So um, that's more onboarding than recruitment, right? But I mean, I think Louise covered it well before, which is that that, that, that resilience and adaptability and, and um, flexibility is definitely what we're looking for, right? So obviously people come into a role that has got some definition, but we, 
we have had to redeploy a number of our team across on-premise or Salador or GTR. Um, and, and we've seen people come into roles that they um, are quite different than the roles that they were doing, you know, the week before. So, so that definitely has risen to the top of the um, top of the want list is just someone who's got some, you know, skills that are transferable um, and, um, and, and attitude is, 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 is more important than ever in that space. Hmm. All right. Now, Eric, over to you in terms of a um, bit back onto the kind of the innovation piece around um, coping versus fueling growth. And I'm interested to hear how Perno started to um, galvanise all that energy of just coping and working in the short term yeah. and moving your teams into that medium to long term growth. How's that yeah. been going? Yeah, well, um, well I, I think, you know, what we realized as a, as a leadership team pretty quickly is that we, we needed to ensure that the business was, was stable from a, from a COVID perspective. And I think we, we built a strong foundation to do that. But, you know, within the first two weeks, we started talking about, you know, what, what will the future look like and where will future growth opportunities come from? So for, for us, uh, we had actually recently gone through a restructure uh, in December. So it, it was pretty timely for us to start rolling out our new growth model. And, and we took that opportunity to actually um, ensure that, you know, number one, we made sure that the, the well-being and the, the and structure of our business was fit for purpose moving forward uh, and, and moved from that to then addressing, you know, how we chose to both activate and kind of budget against the, the brands into the future. So it was something that we, we committed to do relatively quickly. Um, you know, obviously continuing to check back from a COVID perspective, but I think it was important to us to not be too reactionary and to make sure that we set up, you know, the team both from a people perspective, but also from operationally and commercially so that we were set up for a kind of long-term term growth. So um, yeah, we didn't really take a, a COVID first approach. It was very much like, how do we continue, how do we ensure business con continuity, but move into a, a, a future growth phase very, very quickly um, you know, probably by mid-March, actually. Mm. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Now, there's a, a relatively long question I can see in the chat, but one of the the, the words that's zooming out at me is ecom, um, and it certainly is another buzzword that's come out of um, the pandemic. So, um, Louise, have you seen any dramatic shift in your ecom platform, and have you actually put anything in place to to kind of jumpstart it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in terms of, we have a pretty big e-commerce platform in terms of our home brew side of our business. Um, and that has gone absolutely mental. Um, I think there's a, vir like vir by virtue of two reasons, obviously um, people are in lockdown and it, taking out new hobbies and home brewing is obviously a great um, fun hobby for people who are interested in the brewing process to do. Um, but also obviously having this sort of direct um, sales option via online website um, has also uh, generated that business as well. Um, so we've, it was, um, the team did a phenomenal job to be able to manage at one point, I think they were getting about a month's worth of orders every week and um, we weren't really set up for that. So really, unfortunately, they just had to, you know, work essentially 24 seven to get it all done. Um, but moving forward, I think now that we've seen what a surge can be, um, we're definitely putting more in place to help that. But it was really, yeah, there's not much that I can say in terms of how we're able to deal with it because it just, it happened so quickly that we really just had to adjust. I mean, we had sales reps, um, packing orders so it was a crazy time and it was just a matter of teamwork for them to get through it but they did a great job but yeah definitely it's been a booming area and it's one that we've um, realized we're going to have to focus on moving forward. Mm. Yeah I'm not surprised to hear that certainly coming from the coffee sector the amount of in-home coffee and new coffee machines that have been purchased has been gone you know skyrocketed. Um, terrific. All right. So I might, um, back to the kind of working from home and working from the office, there's a question through on the feed around 
Facebook sort of declaring that they might close their offices for good. And we certainly heard a bit coming out of the tech companies. So interested to hear the panelists view on, do you think the days of the traditional office are gone or is there still a role for it? Eric, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, we, we think that, you know, there is a role for office based work long term. I think it's funny, the, the moment that we opened the office back up and put the correct protocols uh, in place for people to come back, we saw, you know, a, a surge of people uh, wanting to, to come to the office and connect. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that's hard to replace. And I think we've touched on it a little bit on this call, but that uh, that ability to interact, whether that's happenstance in the kitchen uh, or in face-to-face -face meetings, I, I think that there's a lot of meetings that are much richer uh, and you have much better outcomes when you have the ability um, to, to, to do that face-to-face. Uh, -face. And I think, you know, the one, you know, one of the things that we, we've talked about a lot as a, as a group is this idea of in inclusiveness and diversity. And I think, um, you know, being able to, you know, physically, uh, you know, uh, interact with people from, you know, different backgrounds, different, have to have different experiences, uh, even if you don't necessarily have a, a project that you're working on with them, just to bounce ideas off them, I think just provides better outcomes from a, from a work perspective. I know that, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, I want to make sure that my team that works on wine and my team that works on whiskey, who's really never have projects that, that overlap, um, see each other's work and, you know, accidentally come across each other and give feedback to one another and kind of help kind of challenge and, and build. And I just think that that, that uh, when you're purely working from home are things that you don't, you don't get. So hundred percent, we see that, you know, longer term, although we'll continue to work flexibly that the office plays a big, big role for, for us uh, as a business. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, Sarah, you're going to say something? Yeah, just totally agree. I was just thinking yeah. as you were talking then, Eric, like my broader team, I feel quite connected with, but the team outside of that, um, you know, there's just been no contact, right? So, you know, there is um, a real miss of that connection unless you're having a direct work relationship. Um, you know, we, we, our CEO got asked this on a town hall recently, and, you know, he certainly is saying that offices will play a really important role for Treasury, um, you know, both from a uh, work, but also a connection um, um, point of view. So yeah, we, we you know, our, our challenge in Melbourne is that our office is in the CBD location. And so therefore public transport is the consideration around um, moving people in and out. So I think people can't wait to get back to the office. A little bit linked to that and, and mental health that you spoke about before, Sal, something I forgot to mention is one thing we did do is we came out quite early and said that there wouldn't be any expectation for people to return to work before next year, just knowing where we were at with Melbourne and, and our location. And that just let people, gave people permission to make some decisions on their own location. We had people that moved home with their parents, people that went to New Zealand, people that moved into state um, because they knew that, you know, there was at least a good four to five months before they would be required to be back in the office. And we still don't even really know what that back in the office will look like. We know there'll be more flexibility, um, but, but um, we also know, you know, many of us can't wait to get back as well. Mm. Any further thoughts on that, Louise? Do we okay to move on? Um, no, I think it's been covered. I think we um, certainly, yeah, we will, I would think for the long term retain our offices, um, uh, especially in South Australia. I mean, it, I think we're incredibly lucky in SA to literally have the, um, you know, the smell of the yeast and malt on our doorstep as you get out of the car in the morning. It makes you feel really connected to what you do on a day to day basis. And um, also the people that can't work from home, the production people, um, it's great that, you know, we all know everyone's names from um, no matter where you are in the business or what your role is, um, there is this amazing interconnection um, between teams and between all staff members. And I think, um, I don't really know what our company culture would look like if we didn't have that, to be honest. So um, I think there's definitely um, room for flexible working um, and having the opportunity to do days from home um, when you need to. Um, but overall, I think it's great that people um, have an office space that they can come to. Um, and I think I certainly know the people in Melbourne are dying to be able to mm -hmm. get back into the office. So, um, yeah. yeah. 
So I think um, there's a bit of interest in the chat um, about this face-to-face -face piece and, and being able to read, you know, the, the I guess, the mental wellness of, of our colleagues. So I just want to go back to that, um, to all of the panellists around, without the face-to-face -face contact, how can you tell that our people really are coping and what measures have your organisations put in place to gauge mental health? So a bit of a big one again, um, but if anyone wants to go first. Sarah, yeah. you ready? Yeah, what, what one thing we've done, which is, um, it's a very simple and, and quite effective um, check-in. So, you know, we do do the one to 10 um, in many of our meetings just to be able to, um, to do a quick temperature check. And look, obviously not everyone feels comfortable sharing in, in, in that environment, but, but there are some people, you know, if they're permanently an eight and then one day they're a six, you know, it could just be a, a little bit of a, um, you know, hand up to just to check in with them outside of that meeting. So that's been, that, that has been quite effective. You know, it's so much more complex than, than just that, but that's been one thing that we have committed to as a leadership team. Um, uh, you know, we, we do talk about the availability to resources and every opportunity that we can. Um, we know calls to our employee assistance line has have gone up in Melbourne. So we do know that there are people um, that are um, entering that system that haven't before. Um, so yeah, we just trying to, you know, increase the conversation, remove the stigma, increase the resources. And then I think it's just dependent on the relationship that you, you know, that you already have with that person and, and look for those cues um, uh, and, 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 you know, try to get behind the half an hour meeting that you keep on, you know, going, going back to back. So it, it really just is about that going that extra mile to check in. Any views on that, Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, very similar. I think, you know, I think it's important for us, uh, for our organizations to have a, a mix of both, you know, formal uh, wellness checks, whether that be, you know, the, the, you know, surveys and, you know, the continuing to provide access and, and knowledge around what, what resources are available, but also continuing to train, you know, the line managers and, and different people to, to, to spot things uh, that, you know, that could be tells for people within, within their teams. And, and then just, you know, making sure that you're creating creating an ongoing environment where people you know, feel that they're psychologically safe to, to flag things. And I think, you know, there's, I think it's that mix of uh, formal and informal um, uh, kind of wellness checks that are, are really important. And I think, you know, just little things around, you know, different teams have found different ways in which to, to do that. Um, whether that's, uh, you know, just and gi giving people the flexibility to do things outside of just focusing on work with work people. So whether that's, you know, fitness challenges, you know, more, most steps is one of the things that we did uh, as a marketing team, making sure that people were getting out when they were working from home. And I know that was kind of limited from a Melbourne perspective, but just, you know, seeing people, you know, and encouraging people to take some time out of their day and, and not caring if they did it at 10 a.m., if that's what they needed to do or taking calls while they walked their dog. You know, those types of things are, are small, but they're really important, I think, for the, you know, uh, the mental health of people, you know, sitting in, in a one room, staring at a computer screen all day is something that I don't think any of us enjoy. So providing uh, a platform for people to feel comfortable moving outside of that space to do their work and being objective based as opposed to face to face um, based, I think, is really important. Hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Any further thoughts, Louise? Oh, just briefly, I'd say that uh, I think um, now more than ever, I've really seen the value in our, um, in our anonymous sort of HR platform. I think uh, luckily that had been brought in long before COVID um, and replacing any sort of annual surveys, but it, we do fortnightly questions. I mean, you can do more than that if you want. Um, and the questions that we've been asking throughout COVID and all, all the responses are anonymous, but it just gives you a really sense good sense of how people are tracking and the ability, even though it's anonymous, to um, respond to them. So uh, one of the family members, um, Mel Cooper, responds to you know, every single one, um, offering support uh, if, especially if people have said they're not happy at that moment. And I think that's been um, fairly powerful. So, you know, just questions. Um, 
whether or not how they're going, um, how they're feeling, but even um, how do you think your workmates are coping? Um, we got a lot of great insights out of that one, not so um, self-centric, but um, looking outwards and just asking people to check around them because um, each, you know, hopefully everyone's connected within their teams, um, even if as an organisation, we can't see within every single one of those teams. Mm, it's a great point. Um, we've got a question on the chat here um, around our customers. So I'll throw this one to you, Sarah, given um, your role um, as a first stop, but happy for anyone else to come in as well. Um, do you think our customers have been more or less accessible during COVID and are they more or less engaged in partnership planning? I would say they, from my experience, they've been more accessible. Um, I think when you remove the travel requirement from either side um, and the um, just the amount of change that COVID, the COVID kick, as we call it from a retail point of view, delivered, that you know, we we really knew that supply became the number one priority for customers very quickly um, as, as, as the panic buying started. So um, I think connection with their business outside of just your normal sales contact, but with their supply teams as well um, was really valuable for us anyway. Um, and then, you know, partnering with our on-premise um, customers as they've gone through different stages of restrictions in, in every state um, and understanding what we can do to support them. So I, I think, I think, you know, we've been quite united but by, by both industry and supplier, right, around how do we get through this together. Um, so I think it's brought out the, the, the best in relationships. Um, and um, I think in terms of, of a partnership point of view, I think people, we've spoke about e-commerce before, I think that's moved <laughs> very quickly up the um, JBP um, agenda items is about how do, we part, how do we support our customers on their e-commerce um, direction, but then also, you know, what does bringing to life MPD look like in a market where you where you're not necessarily having sampling or you know field team visiting? So you know we have had to do things differently, um, but you know if you're working in retail, you're having a you're having a you know it's been a it's been a very interesting year, and then you've kind of you offset that with the challenges we've had in GTR, cellar doors, and on premise. So. You know, I, I think the customers um, have, have been fantastic this year and, and you know, I, I think we'll lean, we've leaned on relationships, but I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's put us in a, a good, good stead for next year. Fantastic. Yeah. It's good to hear. Um, guys, we've got less than 10 minutes to go. So please, just a reminder, if you've got any questions to pop them in the chat. Um, but I'm interested to know also in terms of um, needing to bring out new skills, if you've noticed, panellists, if this new way of working has actually brought out any untapped talent that you had in your team that you wouldn't have seen prior. Anything from, from your team, Eric? Yeah, I, I think there's this center, uh, sense of, uh, and, uh, of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, I guess, this entrepreneurial spirit that has, that's come out. I think, you know, um, you know, uh, marketing teams by nature, you know, like to be pretty creative. And I think this is provide, you know, as I said, you know, at the beginning challenges provide opportunity and, and some of the things that the team have done, we, we had a group of people, for instance, um, you know, develop a program to help support our own on trade customers called meals for mates. And essentially it was, um, you know, partnering with Deliveroo, um, and providing, uh, providing meals, uh, that we would donate, but it, it was a kind of a multifaceted thing wherein the, the, the group of people brought the idea forward that it, it helped keep uh, on-premise partners doors open because it helped drive business there. Um, and then we could also provide uh, a, a code to people who are out of work in the, in, the, in the hospitality industry to actually get some, some free meals when they were on you know, some, some tougher times. So I think you know, that type of thinking, you know, we didn't necessarily always have the ability to maybe foresee when we were in the traditional kind of working space before. And we have, yeah, we have, you know, multiple examples of, you know, teams within within our organization coming up with these, you know, 
great ideas uh, that we could, you know, help drive our business forward, but also, um, you know, help keep our, our some of our customers' lights on in a really challenging time. So that you know, entrepreneurial spirit is something that we've we've really valued, and something that I, you know, I hope that we can continue to foster um, on the, you know, all things innovation related moving forward. So I know we mean, you mentioned something in our catch up about a bit of untapped talent. Oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I was thinking of two people actually as you were talking. So, so certainly, um, I think the um, and it's kind of connected. So, I've been super impressed with our events team and how they have really been able to deliver super engaging, effective events online. And I think that has challenged um, our you know perception of of event management. Um, you know, and whether that's you know we had some pen folds tasting. Um, at release um, a couple of months ago and actually you know we normally make it's obviously a big event and it's a you know we, we bring in all of our um, you know customers into um, hit you know state locations and actually the feedback we had which we would have never have thought of is the ability for a buyer to taste you know a, a, some of the Penfolds collection with his wife or with his family and in the comfort of his own home it was really quite a special occasion for them and so that was just something that you know rather than everyone trying to get to you know one Sydney location the ability for us to reach more people in the comfort of their own home um, was actually uh, was was something that um, was, was a, a benefit that I don't think we had we had considered and the only other one that's come comes to mind is we've done a lot of you know what we call sales university sessions either with winemakers or other capability and you know we've certainly seen um, um, our natural MCs in the business kind of um, have their have their time in the sun. <laughs> Not surprised. All right. Okay. I'm going to do um, two rapid fire questions to all three of you to close it out. The first one is, has come through on the feed around the outlook for Christmas. So, you know, across the sector, we've seen some pretty um, great strong increases. Do we expect that momentum to continue into the Christmas period? Over to you, Louise. We certainly hope so. Um, it's a bit like um, putting your finger up and trying to guess the weather, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you have no idea, um, but I really hope so. I think, um, you know, I, I can't exactly see what would slow it down. Um, so we've just got everything crossed really. Okay, Eric? Yeah, totally agree. I think, uh, yeah, I think consumer patterns at least for the next few months are gonna continue and we're gonna see a, a, a pretty decent Christmas. Mm. Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've all heard the stat that there's going to be a million more Aussies um, domestically in the market. So, um, yeah, we, we just see um, it continuing right through and, and through to February, March, right? The the holiday um, holiday spots are all booked up is what we've heard, you know, in, in yeah. those um, regional areas as well. So, yeah, we absolutely see it. I mean, I know many of our customers have, have, indicated concern with supply chain managing demand over the next three months so yeah I, I see I think we're going to see an absolute um, bumper of a Christmas and let's hope our on-premise customers get a slice of that as well yeah agree we'll keep those vintages coming in the brewery brewing um, and then the last uh, question um, which has come through um, on the feed as well and one that we've talked about is what is the um, for all three of you what is the one thing that you're going to take forward as an organisation as a result of, you know, what's happened with COVID? And I'll go back to you again, Eric. Uh, clarity of communication, I think, is paramount at all levels of the organisation and uh, being united around, you know, one vision. So I think if there's one thing that we've done really well is, is done that, and it's something that I think we uh, see as, a, you know, that's going to be paramount to our success moving Louise? Yeah, mine would be about communication also. I think um, considering uh, along the line of what Sarah was saying before, considering um, what types of communication are necessary in what circumstances and um, just how best to build connections with customers and suppliers. Um, so, you know, do we really need to travel over there? Um, 
can we um, do it, should this meeting be in person rather, even though it's easier to be on Zoom? Um, just really focusing on the quality of the communications and how to most effectively communicate. I think we've all learned a lot about effective communication, what it is, what it looks like. Um, and so just continuing those learnings moving forward. Thanks. And, and finally, Sarah? Yeah, I'll be a broken record here, but I think um, communication and flexibility, you know, are the two um, that we will embed and um, and prioritise and, and, and it's so cr critical to get the best out of our teams and, and to get the best out of, um, you know, our life, right, as well as our, um, as well as our work. So I think those are the two things that we will see as, you know, continue to be part of our DNA going forward. Fantastic. Sounds like we'll be a much better, more three-dimensional person and organisation yeah. for it. So with that, um, I'd really love to thank the three panellists, Eric, Louise and Sarah. It's very generous of you to give up your time, your thinking time, and also um, the transparency with which you shared um, some of your insights and thinking with us to you and your organisation. So a very big warm thanks. And also to everyone behind the scenes at the Drinks Association for putting this together for all of us for free, essentially. Um, you know, there was a fair bit of, of work that went on in the background. So thank you very much to you as well. And let's hope that next time we all get to see each other, whether we want to or not, we can see each other virtually or in person. So all the very best to everyone joining us and have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye now. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Bye.